Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank Fundación Telefónica for uh, having supported and retained and supported this festival for the past six years with such warmth. And I want to thank um, Roca Publishers, with whom we have organized this big mess that we have created here for this afternoon today. And I would also like to thank our uh, guests to be here today and in all of you to share this session with us today. The Hay Festival was born uh, more than 30 years ago in a town in Wales. It's a foundation, it's a non-profit organization, and we have imported this festival to Spain, and we are currently celebrating the 14th edition. The festival this year is been, has been built on uh, around the word uh, fragility, fragility of our existence, and we have invited several writers and philosophers to talk about it, uh, fragility of the democratic values as we have known up until now, and fragility in terms of taking care of our house, the planet. This is why I am really excited about this conversation they're going to be having here today because I'm always looking for reasons that bring me hope about the world to be. So let me introduce uh, to Blanca Rosa Roca as the English say, um, partner in crime. And uh, well, thank you, Shayla, and thank you because when several months ago I showed you the book and I told you that it deserved, uh, you, it, that the author deserved to be in the Hay Festival, uh, you didn't think about it twice. You, we didn't have to even drink a glass of wine to um, buy you in. So thank you, thank you for joining in, and thank you, Susie, for being here, crossing the ocean in, for introducing the book, and thank you, uh, Juanjo, uh, also for being here today. He accepted uh, uh, the first time I asked him, and thank you, everyone, for being with us here today. Thank you all. Um, I'm very happy that we managed to publish this book. I think that uh, last year, uh, exactly. I was in New York visiting the person who sells the rights of the book, and she told me about the book. I presented my offer, and we closed the deal right away. This is something that doesn't hap happen very often, but I want to fight climate change, and I really thought that the idea behind the book was wonderful. And later I learned who was the author, but I found it fantastic, this idea of having this one meal a day where you don't eat any meat or any uh, dairies or eggs, and it's an easy way to contribute to saving the planet. It's a book that is very easy to read, and it's very easy to implement the suggestions that it brings us, and something as easy as just not eating meat at lunch or at dinner. Meat, not eating meat or dairies, you can save about 300,000 liters of water. I don't know the amount of car di carbon dioxide that you can save every year. And there are also recipes and tricks that not only save the planet, but also uh, can improve your health. As Susie says in her book, a uh, vegetarian diet is actually uh, better than Viagra. So it's something that men can be interested about it. Also, it's good for your heart because it doesn't uh, bring the fat uh, in the meat. Your intestines work much better. So not only we would be saving the planet, but we're also saving ourselves. And I think that we all share this mission of trying to take care of ourselves and taking care of the planet at the same time. So thank you, Susie, for um, bringing us this book and for bring, being here today. Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to this uh, chat with uh, Susie Amos. First of all, I would like to say thank you uh, to the High Festival 
of course, um, the publishing uh, house of Edit um, Rock and Fundación Telefónica for being, uh, for letting us be here to speak about what I think we're going to speak about during this uh, evening. That is going to be about the ecological crisis and the answers and responses that we can give to this um, crisis. So, I'm going. Hello, one, two, three, one, two, three. I want to make the introduction in Spanish, but I'll speak in English um, from now on. It will, will be better if we speak the same language and we don't have the intermediate of the translator among us, although my English is not as good as yours, of course. But, <laughs> but well, and my Spanish is not as good as yours. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'll do my best. So, well, first of all, I wanted to briefly introduce the introduce the book i really i really recommend uh, reading it the book has two very um, very different parts from my point of view one is the first the first part which is really how uh, she uh, started uh, basically getting into veganism and what what drove her what drove Susie to becoming vegan and and how she did it from 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 a basically very carnivore life i would say because you were living in a farm in the us which is which is a, a very carnivore place isn't it yes at least, at least that's that's what we that we understand <coughs> um, and then the second the second part is is a much more let's say mm, the ta detailed one on, on on how to how to make that change the nice thing of of the book is that it introduces you into veganism in a very in a very convincing way because on the one hand as as uh, blanca rosa was saying on the one hand it talks a lot about the health aspect of, of becoming vegan and the, and how your health is, is going to be much much better from the first day and the second part is about uh, the environmental impacts of of uh, of the actual uh, uh, how you say the English? animal agriculture yeah exactly exactly yeah. thank you yeah. <laughs> so which is very interesting and we are going to talk a lot, a lot about it because in Spain of course, there is a lot of concern about things like the fires in the Amazon, mm. which is which is something uh, which is really touching us. And there is a link. We will talk about it. A very clear link between what is happening in the Amazon these days and and what we eat. We will talk about it. But as well, climate change is is touching us very strongly. Spain is one of the countries in Europe, and this is what the scientists uh, are saying. One of the countries in Europe where climate change is is uh, having a, a higher impact because we are in a region which is between the the more humid climates in the north of Europe and and the arid climates from from Africa. Mm -hmm. So we are kind of a, of a frontier region, the Mediterranean region, and is very effective. Just yesterday, we had in the in the parliament a debate exactly on this because. Yesterday, and this is the good news, or for me it's the maybe the only good news, because as I was telling you before, the Spanish politics is not bringing us many good news these days, but, but there's one, which is that yesterday the Congress, the Spanish Parliament, approved the declaration of, of uh, climate emergency, that saying that Spain is a country in climate emergency. It was, it was in, in, in a sense, driven by the fact that last week we had uh, big floods in the in the Mediterranean region, this is something which which is uh, which happens every every now and then. But but this time has been bigger and larger and stronger than it has ever been before, which is clearly another yet another sign of what's happening with with our climate. So this is why. Not only, not only because of of, uh, of the floods, but we have had this summer terrible forest fires in in, in our in our country. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the Spanish scientists have told us that summer in, in Spain is now five weeks longer <laughs> than it was only 40 years ago. So when I was a kid, uh, at, at the end of, of August, in early September, it was already the bad weather coming. Mm -hmm. Now we have five more weeks of, of summer, which is, unfortunately, doesn't mean five more weeks of holidays. It means <laughs> five more weeks of, of, of heat. Uh, global uh, temperatures in Spain have risen strongly in, in a larger way than the, than the medium. Spanish cities, for example, are 1.6 degrees warmer than they were 30 years ago. This is what what uh, scientific studies say in, in Spain. The Mediterranean Sea is increasing its temperature 0.34 degrees per decade. I, I have this this these numbers in my in my mind very very fresh because of yesterday's debate. <laughs> so this is why. But anyway, so the issue is is important for us. Uh, and it's relevant, and it's more and more relevant for the for the Spanish public and for the Spanish people. And I, I know that many people is asking themselves, what can I do about this? Mm. What can I do about this? And this is uh, exactly where where your book comes in, because not only not only you you tell us what can you what we can do, but how to slowly get into it in a nice way, mm -hmm. which I find as, as well very, uh, very, very good from, from the book, because it invites you. It doesn't, it's, it's, not, it's not kind of drastic, uh, but it's, it's an invitation to try with uh, changing one meal per day into vegan to try it. And I think it's, uh, it's a very nice invitation. So uh, thanks, thanks for coming. And uh, of course, people is here to listen to you, not to me. So I sat up now, and, and uh, maybe the first is that you introduce the book first. Sure. So, um, buenas tardes. Um, so, OMD, it stands for one meal a day. And it's not about just eating one meal a day, it's about changing one of your meals a day. So whether you're changing breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And this can be something as simple as putting soy milk on your cereal instead of cow's milk, or having a bean and veggie burrito for lunch, or veggie paella, if you're, since we're here in Spain, or um, pasta with tomato sauce. Salsa de tomate? Salsa de tomate. I'm trying. <laughs> um, so it's, it's very incremental pieces, and like you said, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to be able to change those, those things to one meal a day. Typically, people feel better, so sometimes they'll choose two meals a day. And it's not about perfection. It's not about 100%. I do have people in my life that have gone 100%, but that's their journey. Everybody has a complete different journey. But the idea behind OMD is it's not only good for your body, but it's good for the environment. And, you know, when we're talking about, about the Amazon, people don't realize that animal agriculture is the second leading cause of greenhouse gases and climate change more than all transportation combined every car every airplane every bus everything so you know you might be out there being able to drive in a prius or a tesla or a, you know some kind of a hybrid or an electric car but if you're driving through mcdonald's you're not helping <laughs> Um, so I, I went down the road of, um, of the plant-based world. So it was May 6th, 2012, and my friend had been telling me for about nine months, uh, he's from New York, he would say, Susie, you gotta watch Forks Over Knives. So it's this documentary called Forks Over Knives, and it's about the detrimental effects of animal, uh, animal products on your health. And I have 
cancer and heart disease in my family. My husband, Jim, has heart disease and cancer in his family. And his mother has severe heart disease. And they were, the doctors were already telling him, because his mother had such bad heart disease, they were telling him as a precaution that he should probably start to take some medication. And I was like, no, you can't do that. The side effects are horrific. And he basically said to me, look, that's life. That's what you do. You get older, you have to take medication, you feel bad, and then you die. <laughs> and I knew deep down that there had to be there had to be a solution and I felt like it had to do with food but I didn't know exactly what it was and I had this movie Forks Over Knives I grabbed the DVD one day May 6th and took it down to the gym to watch it I was on the treadmill and after 10 minutes I had to get off and sit down I was so I felt so betrayed <laughs> And I felt like I had been lied to my whole life. And I got really angry that all of these advertisements constantly my whole life had been, I've been told you have to eat meat to be strong. You have to drink milk to have strong bones. I grew up in Oklahoma. And we, we still have our farm. Um, but when I was a little girl, we raised cows and we raised pigs and we ate them. And I, uh, it's, you know, Oklahoma is, it's all full of cowboys and yeehaw and, you know, eat your steak and your burgers and chicken fried steak and, and all of those are you, things. Are you, are you going to present the book in Oklahoma? Because it's... I already have. You already have. It's great. Test. How, how yeah. was it? No, it was really good. Was it? It doesn't matter where I've been in the world because, like you said, it's an invitation. It's just about dipping your toe in mm. and just giving it a try, just changing a little. My brother, my oldest brother, does not believe in climate change. So we know who he follows politically. <laughs> yeah. um, but he doesn't believe in climate change. So I don't talk to him about that because it's like oil and water. It's not going to work anyway. But he called me one day and he said, Hey man, do you have it? Do you know anything I can do for my high blood pressure? And I said, Well, Dave, yes, I do. And if you want to know, I'll tell you. Yeah, no, I'm open. So I started talking to him about eating more plant based. And he assured me that he didn't eat that much meat until we went through his menu of <laughs> what he ate every day. Um, but he very proudly calls me regularly and says that he's now doing two meals a day. And this is a brother that, you know, bacon, sausage, eggs for breakfast, and, you know, burgers for lunch, and ribs and steak and things like that for dinner. So if he can do it, anyone can. But really, uh, it, you know, I was in New Zealand. Their major GDP is beef and dairy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how receptive people are to the idea of just changing one meal a day. I always hear, oh, well, that sounds, that sounds easy. That sounds doable. Um, and, you know, one of the things that when you're talking about what can people do as individuals, and I realize how fortunate I am. I have, I grew up in Oklahoma, but I've, I've lived this very magical life. And I have this platform to be able to start schools. I do drive an electric car. Our ranch has solar. I started a um, eco dress design contest. I, I have the ability to do these things, but I know that they're not making that much difference. It's barely scratching the surface. And I used to work at a, uh, the largest environmental NGO in the United States, and no one ever talked about animal agriculture at all. But I would come home from those meetings really depressed 
You know, I would hear about the floods, I would hear about the fires, I would hear about deforestation, biodiversity loss, dead zones, melting glaciers, all those things. And I would just kind of think, <laughs> what, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And very often people think that and then they just look the other way and they continue doing what they're doing. But if you, if you decided to change one of your meals a day for one year, you would save 200,000 gallons of water and the carbon equivalent of driving from Los Angeles to New York. So every single time you sit down and put something on your plate to eat, you're either hurting the environment or you're helping it. So you can, as an individual, make you, a difference. You convinced me already. <laughs> <laughs> my, my little... <laughs> Let me let me say something about the Amazon fires because maybe we are talking about it, but maybe people doesn't have all the information. But it does have a link to to Spain and to the Spanish economy because Spain is the second importer of Brazilian soya from the European Union. Mm. These fires are mainly being uh, provoked to gain uh, to gain land to cultivate uh, soya and that soya is used to feed um, cows all around the world and, and uh, very, very much in Spain. So when we see the fires in Brazil and we hate Bolsonaro for his statement and so on, as well we, we have to think that there is a link on, on what we are doing here. And I think that people mm -hmm. should know that. And I don't think this is this information is spreading very no. much because we see the fires in the news, uh, but what is behind those fires? There's not much information no, they, about they, it. No, they they aren't really talking about it. I mean, you can kind of dig deep and and find out about it. Um, Jim and I were actually in Brazil in 2010 twice, and we flew over the Amazon and then all of a sudden we just saw it stop and we were asking so many questions and it was it was for either grazing animals grazing cows or grow, growing soy and corn so seventy to eighty percent of the corn and soy go to feed the animals and do you know how many humans you could feed by feeding, you cut out the middleman, you cut out the cow, you, could, you can feed 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 times as many humans by giving them that grain, but they're giving it to the cows. So yeah, that's exactly why the Amazon is burning. Well, the Amazon should be preserved anyway. It is not, it's not land for, for growing anything. Let me ask you a couple of tough questions. Okay. Uh, one, one has to do with... with um, Social, um, how to say it? In Spain, there is some people who say, "Well, this this thing about green consumption is something for the rich." Mm. Uh, if you if you are green and you and you care about what you eat, and and uh, then it means that you have the economic resources on your family to deal with it. But poor people uh, cannot. Uh, afford it. How, right. how would you react to this? Um, I get that question a lot, actually. Um, and I disagree. Mainly because, so the, the first big study that was done around animal agriculture and your health was done by a doctor, um, Colin Campbell. And he wrote a book called The China Study which is what Forks Over Knives is based on. So it's a 40-year research project that he did in China. And they went all around the country for 40 years documenting what people were eating. The peasants in the country were eating plant-based. The more affluent people, they were the ones putting meat on their table. So it's a sign of affluence it was very much then to be able to put meat on their on their plates the peasants were healthy they didn't have heart disease they didn't have diabetes they weren't obese they didn't have cancers the affluent people 
had all of those things, all of those diseases. So being able to, you know, buy a bag of soybeans, to buy a bag of lentils or peas or fava beans or black beans or whatever they might be, and a big bag of grains that could be rice, it can be quinoa, it can be amaranth, anything. And to be able to make so many different kinds of meals out of that, you can make chilies, you can make tamales, you can make um, you know, tacos and all of those kinds of things out of, out of just these two small ingredients. You know, people then say to me, well, what about organic veggies? That's really, you know, pricey. It's really expensive. If you have a farmer's market, most people do. You don't go at the beginning of the day of the farmer's market. You go at the very, very end when all of the farmers are trying to get rid of all of their produce. And you can get it for half the price and sometimes even less than that. There are some markets that sell fruit that's not perfect. I and mean, we in the States, we call it ugly fruit or ugly mm. vegetables. Mm. Um, it might not be perfect. You might have a carrot that's like, you know, got four prongs coming out of it. They're just as nutritious. Sometimes they're even tastier, funnily enough. But that's a great way of doing it. And the other way is you go in the grocery store and you get frozen vegetables and frozen fruits. And they're a lot less money than, you know, buying them fresh sometimes. And they taste just as good in a stew or in a saute or yeah. something like that. But, you know, in a city like Madrid, for example, we don't have such a thing as farmer's markets. <coughs> uh, we have supermarkets and uh, there is there's a movement which is growing, which is of uh, consumer cooperatives in which uh, people uh, get together mm -hmm. and they get in contact directly with the um, uh, with the farmers mm -hmm. so uh, so you have the direct relationship and then you you know what what you are buying uh, which is the best way i think in in a big city to to be able to have uh, to have uh, access to organic food right Because right. otherwise, um, we have uh, there are there are bio supermarkets. Not many, not many. It's I've been in them. You have been in yeah, them. Yeah, they're, they're not fantastic. many, but they're not that many. They're not yeah. that many. And this is this is what what uh, they a criticism we 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 hear very often. That's not very accessible. It is more expensive than a normal market, and and this is. Of course, my response to that is, is if we increase the market, if organic, if organic is the new normal, let's say, the new mainstream, then the production will grow. Yes. And, and we will, yeah. it, will, it will be cheaper. Well, and I think you're absolutely right. And I also think, too, that, um, you know, the, the, when you're going into these stores the um, yeah the, there's the supply and the demand that happens um, and people more and more and this is what I find everywhere too and especially with younger people they want to know where their food is coming from and what's in it and is it sprayed or is it not sprayed it's it's becoming more and more because one of the things that um, that I'm doing too with um, when we went plant-based all of our investments changed so it all goes through a plant-based lens now because we just want to do everything that we can to help make the, the planet a better place so we actually started buying farms we built a fractionation plant so we um, it's a pulse fractionation plant so peas and beans and lentils and chickpeas and we put them through the fractionation plant and we get proteins fibers and starches and I worked with the food center up in Saskatchewan to create OMD food products mm -hmm. so these will start to roll out in Canada probably within a month and then eventually they'll be what, what everywhere. Does, what, what does it mean one uh, OMD product? An OMD food product. food product. So it's they're made with there are all kinds of things. We have sauces. We have got cheeses. We have 
burgers, we have um, snacks. It's basically vegan food for one day or... or well, it's, it's um, plant-based foods, right? Yeah. So they're all made out of pea protein or fava bean protein, chickpea protein, and things like that. Um, and every time you, you purchase the, the foods, we also will be cloning and planting old growth trees. So like the big sequoias that are in Northern California, they will not survive climate change. So what they're doing is they're cloning them and they're moving them north to British Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, one of the things, and I, I bring that up because um, one of the big things is people want to know what the ingredients are. They want to know where their food is coming from. So by people creating groups and co-ops and working directly with the farmer, that's a great way to start. Yeah, and it's a way of, of changing the world from the, from the very base. Mm -hmm. one, one other question always comes up and there's a number of articles I have been reading in the in the last few days. It's about about responsibility on the environmental crisis. Um, because when whenever we talk about the environmental crisis, the climate crisis and so on, uh, there is a lot of, of talking on, on individual responsibility. But there is as well corporate responsibility mm -hmm. and sometimes corporations don't want to talk or, or they like and this is this is another let's say uh, it's it is an issue and it's it's been discussed you know to which point uh, corporations like us to talk about individual responsibility so they cover or, or they escape or they hide behind behind that and say well it is it is all our, it's, it's our collective responsibility. It's not the responsibility of corporations. And uh, mm. I, I do think that, that there is as well a big responsibility of governments, corporations, and so on. I would like to, what, what do you think about it? I think it's everyone's responsibility at this point. If they want a planet to live on, if they want a planet for their children to live on, I mean, that's what wakes me up every day, is thinking about not only my children, or the children at the school that I started, or my grandchild, but the collective children everywhere I travel. I think about these children that I see, and I wonder what kind of a planet, there's a bunch of, there's a couple of kids over there. <laughs> what kind of a planet are you all going to grow up on? And I know the kind of planet that I grew up on. I was really lucky. And I want you all to be able to grow up on the same kind of planet, one that has clean air and clean water and nice summers and nice winters and nice springs and, and autumns. And it's all of our responsibility to be able to make changes. Um, and, you know, when... When, when I hear of people, you know, um, you, you use the word activist or environmentalist or whatever that is, and they, they go and they talk to governments and they're like, you need to do something about climate change. You need to be, you know, taking action. But you rarely hear, what can you do? You know, which is why I continue to come back to, you know, being able to be empowered as an individual because you can make a difference and not everyone can drive an electric car not everyone can do those kinds of things um, but everyone does eat every day and they can make a difference and in terms of the corporations this is something that um, I want to change everything. <laughs> um, we are. We have created a, a corporate pitch deck 
to go into corporations to talk to them about offering OMD within their corporations and becoming becoming an OMD uh, certified corporation. We already have Swarovski signed up to do that, and they've got you know they're in, they're represented in I think 28 different countries and have hundreds of thousands of employees. So this this actually makes me really happy. Um, and a lot of corporations do. They, they hide and they greenwash and they say, oh, no, we're being eco. Um, but this is definitely something they can do. And they will have more productivity. They would have less illness. They would have, um, you know, lower health care. Yeah, but it depends which corporation. For example, uh, there is one corporation which is called Monsanto. Yes, exactly. They have, they have a blacklist. I'm in the blacklist of Monsanto. Which is for me, I'm proud of it. You know, being in the, it was it was published um, some weeks ago because uh, a judge ordered uh, the company to to publish who is who is there in the blacklist, and uh, yeah. I am one because. What's the, the book? No, no, not the book. The a blacklist oh, of, okay. of of activists. Yes, yeah, 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 and yeah. Because basically, in this case, it has to do with. Glyphosate, glyphosate. Yeah, gly like gly we call it glyphosate. Yeah, glyphosate. Yeah. Because uh, there is a campaign to ban glyphosate, which is their product. Yep. And they are very, very angry about it, so they are trying to target activists. So, I mean, there are corporations which, which obviously will change, True. but others. Yeah. I find it. Uh, but you hard find the do. ones that can build up. Yeah, and, exactly. then it, and then there'll be ten on this side and one over there. Exactly. And if they don't step up to the plate... You so, you, so you you are in favor of a positive approach, which yes. means guiding, guiding the, good, the good guys to the fight and isolating the bad guys. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, because I come from, I come from a more confrontational culture, you know? Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we go and we jump on there and... That's well, what is what is the adage um, that that you fight gets stronger, and that that you focus on gets bigger. So, I actually don't like to use the word fighting climate change. Mm -hmm. I think that you know moving the needle on our climate crisis. And what kind of things can you do to move the needle on climate crisis? And you were talking, um, you know, when we were back backstage there, you were talking about, you know, which approach is the is the most important. And I think, you know, it's it's like when you it's like when you use a. Do you all have convection ovens here? So an oven where you turn a fan on and it cooks it all the way around, mm -hmm. right? So that's how I make my chili. I put the chili in, and then I don't have to stir it all the time, so it cooks it from all the way around. And so that's the, the metaphor. You start with the children. You start with the mommies. Mommies are responsible for purchase, purchasing 85% of all of the household purchases, so all of the food. They're making those purchases. So educating the mommies, teaching the children how to garden, working with the corporations. Once, once there's a groundswell and that demand is there, they have, to, they have to create the supply. So, you know, one of the things people are always talking to me too, they say, well, it's just a trend. You know, this whole plant-based thing is just a trend. It's this cool thing to do now. Well, if that was the case, then the food industry wouldn't be spending hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, creating plant-based foods for humans. The beef industry is starting to invest in plant-based meats. The dairy industry is starting to invest in plant-based milks. All you have to do is follow the money. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, not only is it, they, they may be in it completely for profit. Fine. Yeah, it's going to help the environment. Exactly. They change, yeah. that's the point, eh? Exactly. So some, some years ago I was um, um, listening to a scientist, environmental scientist, and, and she was asked, 
is there hope? Is there hope for us? Is there hope for the planet? And she said, there is hope. Uh, she had three, three reasons. One of them was that on, on her experience, the nature recover very quickly. So if you leave na nature in peace, uh, it would recover. Like, for example, if you stop burning and destroying the Amazon slowly, it will, it will recover. The second uh, was because she, so she, she knew that a lot of people is working to stop the environmental destruction, mm -hmm. is working in that direction. And the third, which is for me the contentious one, the one I, she said, because I think that the human being is an intelligent species. And I thought, hmm. Yeah. You know, I wrote, I wrote a book which was called The Planet of the Stupids, talking about, <laughs> talking about humans. So, do you think there is hope? And well, I have a story about hope. So, um, about a month after Jim and I went plant-based, um, well, I'll go, I'll go back to that, the, a little bit back to that story. So, after I watched Forks Over Knives, and I realized that that was the answer to, you know, the health part of it. And I ran up to the house and I found Jim and I said, Babe, I said, I need an hour and a half of your time tomorrow. So this movie is 90 minutes. And he said, Oh, okay, where are we going to go? And I said, We're not going to go anywhere. We're going to watch a movie. And he said, Oh, cool. I love movies. What are we going to watch? And I said, We're going to watch um, a movie. And I'm not going to tell you what the name of it is, but I just want to watch it, and then we're going to have a conversation. Well, we watched it, and by the time we got from the TV room into the kitchen, he said we shouldn't have any more animal products in the house. And 24 hours later, it was all cleaned out. We even had goats up at our ranch, and we were creating goat yogurt and goat cheese and goat milk, and it was really, really good. <laughs> and within 48 hours, we stopped the production of that, and we kept the goats for quite a while because they're really cute and <laughs> and they're good for fire abatement. We, as you know, we have massive fires in in California. Mm -hmm. And Jim actually started educating me on the environmental issues. I mentioned earlier that I was working with the largest environmental NGO in the United States. They never mentioned a word about animal agriculture, I learned all about the dead zones, biodiversity loss, deforestation, melting glaciers, climate change. I mean, it was the most depressing thing in the world. Um, but no one ever, ever talked about animal agriculture. So he started telling me, and he gave me a book, which I read, and then from there I just became ravenous to find out more about the environment, but it was really difficult. There wasn't a lot out there. I found another very small book. And we were walking on the beach one day. Now, if you know my husband, he's kind of a doomsday kind of guy. So his movies, Terminator and The Abyss and Titanic and Avatar, it's like death and <laughs> destruction and we're all going to die and there's no hope and and he actually when we first started dating 23 years ago I said something about hope and he said I hate that word <laughs> I don't use the word hope and I was like oh okay and he didn't I never heard him use the word hope he has a t-shirt that says hope is not a strategy <laughs> and he wears it and we were walking on the beach that day, and he said to me, you know, babe, for the first time in my life, I have hope. <laughs> I was like, I literally, I almost fell in the ocean. And he said, the more people, the more people that we can inspire to go plant-based, the more we can move the needle on climate change. And it was in that moment that I knew, I knew I wanted to write a book, I knew I wanted to create documentaries and content for children, for mommies, for men, for whoever, 
whomever could be inspired, because that will move the needle on climate change. So let's, let's get into the content of the book a little bit more. How would you convince those of us here to start with one meal a day, vegan one meal, one vegan meal a day? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think I, I started with it a little bit, you know, just incrementally using soy milk or almond milk on your cereal in the mornings or having... Which, which, which meal would you choose? Which would I choose? To start with, I mean, would you start with breakfast? With oh, there's a really fun way. Okay, this is what I did with my children. So you go to the store, you get, you know, I, 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 the ones that I saw at Bio, I saw rice milk, almond milk, soy milk. I believe there was a cashew milk and a macadamia milk. And when I was at home with the children, we put all the milks out, we blindfolded everyone, and we did a taste test. And everybody wrote down on a piece of paper which ones they liked the best. So we ended up, you know, with, I like rice milk. Jim and the kids like soy milk. Um, but one of the kids likes almond milk. So we kind of ended so you up... Need, you need a budget for milks in your, <laughs> at your home. <laughs> I know. But, you know, so here's an interesting thing. People, when you were talking about the, um, that it's expensive. So... Jim has had one cold in seven and a half years, and that he just got. He's down in New Zealand shooting Avatar right now. Um, and one cold, no flus, no stomach problems, and I've been, I had a, uh, a lung thing last year only once in seven and a half years and it was right after the fires so it was connected to breathing the smoke mm -hmm. in we don't go to the doctor so we don't have we don't take medication and so right away our health bills go down the children don't get sick our doctor actually texts me every three months to say, hey, how are you guys doing over there? Just want to make sure you're okay. It's like, we're good. So it's, it's um, you know, that it's, it's really amazing, you know, the benefits from it. But you live in California, which is a bit of a, it's a bit of a, of a, um, of different from the rest of the U.S., isn't it? We um, in yeah. terms of, in terms, I mean, in terms of, of the environmental awareness, and in terms of, of uh, you know, taking, uh, doing things to save the environment, I think California is a bit different. You remember that book, that book, Ecotopia? Mm -hmm. uh, I, for me, it was, it was something uh, a book I read when I was very young. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, Ecotopia, I think the author was called Ernst Kallenbach, mm -hmm. uh, and it is. The story of three states from the U.S., California, Oregon, and um, which is the other one? Three in the West. Um, the, the three in the West. Uh, Washington, Washington, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That they get independent and they declare a green, uh, a green regime. Mm -hmm. And then a journalist comes in. And, so California is different, isn't it? But how is it? Do you, do you think, talking about hope, do you think the U.S. has hope? Is hope for the U.S. because, you know, I mean, we see what we see here from here. Uh, you know, we, we see Donald Trump, which is somehow a climate change denier. He wants to get the U.S. out of of uh, of the there Paris Agreement. Yeah. Uh, and how how much? And it, you know, it, it seems that that he's he may be reelected. He may be reelected. Uh, I hope he isn't, but that's my point of view. Um, so, I mean, what what's going on in the U.S.? Why why is this happening? It's challenging. It's it's challenging, and frankly, as an American, it's embarrassing. Um, and you know, when you think about the eight years that Obama was in office. 
and all of the things that he did that were so great for people, for civil rights, for the environment, for, you know, you can just check off the boxes of all of the things that he did that were positive. And it just feels like um, that man who will remain nameless <laughs> just goes in and reverses absolutely everything. Everything that's good. And it, it seems like it's every single day that something's happening, whether it's, you know, allowing plastic bottles in the, in the public parks, you know, allowing factories to, to put their, their waste into the, the rivers. You know, it's one thing. Burning coal, I mean, it's, I don't understand it. And it's really challenging because I do have family members in Oklahoma that support him. Mm -hmm. Quite a few of them. So you think that, do you think that the best way to somehow move on in the U.S. as well is by taking the positive approach? Making people change from the from the base. Or? You know, I mean, I I do think the best way is uh, leading by example. What I have found is that, and I've, I know that it's happened with me, is that you know it feels like everything that this man does to change things to the negative, it just fires us up more. Mm to go and do more, you know? I mean, I, I've always had a flame, but it is a, it is a full-on wildfire at this point to go and do as much as I can. And I find that, um, you know, other people in environmental circles, even people that aren't in environmental circles, you know, you, you, see, them, you see them switching over. One of my brothers actually um, did vote for Trump and he is really regretting it right now and i guarantee he will not vote for him again and he you know, he drives an electric car he's vegan he he does you know all of these and he lives in oklahoma so he does a lot of things to help the environment well i'm being told that our time is is is, is ending i know we, we can sit to, here for days we have to to finish, unfortunately, because I would, I am, as, as you are a passionate of, of, of these issues and yeah. would, would be talking for hours. Let me ask you one last question, which is, uh, why would you recommend your book? Why would you tell people, why do you think your book could be a good reading for people here? Um, well, I think that there's a multi-prong I see plant-based eating is like a silver bullet. And you can be deciding to eat plant-based because of your health. You might have heart disease, you might have diabetes, you might have cancer, you might have autoimmune issues, you know, achy joints, things like that. You might be doing it for the environment because you're aware of the environmental issues with animal agriculture. You might be doing it because of the horrendous behavior that happens around slaughtering animals that we eat. You might want better skin or a slimmer body. You might want a better sex life, <laughs> which I talk about in the book, <laughs> um, which a lot of people don't understand really, because if you don't have good blood flow up here, and you won't have good blood flow if you're eating animal products. But if you're eating plants, your blood automatically opens up. But if you don't have good flow, blood flow up here, you're not going to have it down there either. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but the book actually, it starts out with all the health benefits. I am not a doctor, but I worked with a team of doctors to give me all of the information about you know, all of the research that's been done, all of the, the meta studies, um, the metadata that's, that's been collected, you know, from all of these research projects that they've done around plant-based eating and lifestyle change. And then I, then the second 
Part of it is around the environment. And I worked with Chatham House and Oxford University and Loma Linda and um, climate scientists around the world to help me collect all of the information about the environmental degradation created by animal agriculture. And then it has shopping lists and it's got meal plans and it's got recipes. All of the meat, the recipes actually have the environmental savings that we created called the Green Meter Eater. And that is, um, that was based out of Loma Linda. So we actually took all of the ingredients and found the carbon footprint of each of the ingredients. There are, um, so it's really a how-to. So I, and all the recipes in there are from my family and my children and some of my friends. So it's real food for real people. It's easy to make. There are a lot of kitchen hacks in there. And so I basically take your hand and I show you how you can change one meal a day or how you can do two or how you can blow up your kitchen and go vegan overnight <laughs> if that's what you choose to do. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's an invitation, like you said. It's an invitation to making the world a better place for all of our children to grow up in. Because if we don't do something about the environment, it won't matter if we're healthy. It won't matter if we have environmental schools. It won't matter if we have electric cars, if we don't have a planet to live on. Thank you very much, Susie. It's Thank been a pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Wow. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Allí fuera hay una mesa con libros si alguien quiere que se lo Outside you will see a table with books if you want to have the author sign in it and also Juan if you wish.